Last time I showed an example of Lighttable as a generalized editor for Clojure, but the real power of it is actually in being able to quickly model domains. Let's take a look at three examples. The first mode we'll look at is a benchmarking mode. It allows us to take two variations of some piece of code and see what their performance characteristics are. So we run the first one to set a baseline, and then we run the second one to then see what the differences are based both on the graph and the little table we get down below. In this case, we're looking at the very simple difference between map and parallel map, but there are some nice features built in in case the code were a little bit more complicated. So here I've changed increment to decrement, and now the baseline results do not match this run's results. They're highlighted in red to show that most likely what we've done here is introduced a bug. Now, these boxes can actually hold any arbitrary code. It doesn't have to just be a single function. So let's adjust the scenario so that PMAP's actually faster. We'll do that by creating this something slow function that has a thread sleep for two milliseconds in it, and we'll map that over everything. We also want to change the benchmark, otherwise we'll be sitting here waiting forever for it to finish. And so you can see we'll change a couple numbers up here, and we'll rerun our baseline, hitting command enter. And this takes a second because it's sleeping. And you can see we get new bars here, and then if we go down here and change our second run, and run it, you'll notice PMAP is significantly faster. And so what we have here is a simple mode built in a couple of hours to work with our little benchmarking library. Now let's take a look at another example. This one is for a SQL DSL written in Clojure called Corma. So if I hit Command Enter in that top box holding the Clojure code, it executes it and shows me the results of the SQL query on the right hand side in a little list. But you'll notice underneath that there are two more boxes. One shows me the SQL that's generated by that closure, and underneath that you also see that we get a map representing the query that we're actually executing based on Corma's own implementation. So what we get is a little workbench, a way for us to try out and test our Corma code and see and make sure that our results are what we expect, but also to see exactly what SQL it's generating and even understand exactly the query object that it builds up over time. And one thing that's kind of interesting about its implementation is that it will, in real time, fill in those two bottom boxes. So after you've stopped typing for about 400 milliseconds, it goes ahead and figures out what the SQL was, what the query object looks like, but doesn't execute it. That's up to you. You have to press Command Enter to do that. Now, just like with our previous example, this can take any arbitrary code. The only rule is that it has to return a query object at the end or something that Corma somehow knows how to deal with. So if we change it so that the query is built up over multiple expressions, we'll see that everything still does what we expect. All right, so these past two examples have been modes built around specific libraries in Clojure and building very specific tools to those. Now let's take a look at something completely different. This is a mode for building websites. On the left-hand side, we have a list of the routes that we've defined. On the right-hand side, we have an embedded browser. But this isn't for building websites in Clojure. It's for building websites in Python. More specifically, it's for building websites using the Flask microframework. So what we're seeing when I click on the routes is that the browser changes to that page, and then boxes of all the code needed to serve that page pop up as well. If I modify these to include something new, those boxes will show up themselves. If I press Command Enter, I execute the code and the browser refreshes. So you can see here there's this name attribute. If I add this name and set it equal to Chris and press Command Enter, I then get the evaluated code. So this works with code from all over your project. In this case, it brought in templates. But I can also reference some other thing in some other Python file, in this case, uh, a track function. And you'll notice it brought it up immediately. And if I go here and then add uh, you know, something from one of my models, my user model here, I ask for user.me and evaluate it, did the right thing, but let's go change that to not be Chris, we'll change it to John, evaluate that, and you'll see the browser refreshed again. So this has changed the fundamental unit in a website from being files or even necessarily functions to actually being routes, and it allows us to organize all of our code into these routes, basically, even though they're actually stored in files themselves. Then I can evaluate and see the, the effects of my changes immediately. Another thing to note is that the boxes are different colors. That's because they're representing the different layers of our application, our routing code, our modeling code, our template code. And we can turn these on and off as we see fit based on whatever we're doing. 
we're working just on our routing stuff, we don't need to see all the templates. We don't need to see our models, whatever the case may be there. So there you have it. Lighttable is speaking a little bit of Python. But what's important is not the languages I've shown and not even the examples. What matters is that Lighttable is an environment that you can mold to fit the problem you're trying to solve. And that is the future of tools.